Okay, so this beautiful heart that I drew many, many years ago, um, we're going to start with how blood flows through the heart and why because um, it'll rip all the color. I already know that. <laughs> Done. Um, so how blood enters the heart and goes through the heart and how once we figure out what some pathophysiology issues are that we deal with with our patients, why, um, why they occur and why the people die from them. Okay. So in your body, our cells everywhere use all of the, well, a majority of the oxygen that we carry around in our blood. So if you remember back to pre-Christmas, I had talked about how the lungs pick up um, air and they get rid of carbon dioxide, okay? So a lot of people think that it goes directly to the lungs first to get that, but it's not the case. In our body, all of our cells use most of the oxygen, so then what's remaining in blood from the body goes back up towards the heart, but it flows up. What type of blood vessel um, would that blood be in if it's flowing up? The veins. The veins. Yeah, so veins um, carry blood back to the heart, okay? Most people uh, like to think that veins actually carry deoxygenated blood, but that's not true, and I'm going to show you why here in a minute. So all of the veins from your toes, from your arms, from your brain, everything comes back to the heart, and they all converge. If it's coming from the upper body, it goes into what's called the superior vena cava or vena cava, depending on how fancy you are. And from the lower part of your body comes into the inferior vena cava or vena cava. So here's some fun anatomy and physiology we have to do for MFR anyways. Superior means above, inferior means below. It comes from the old um, idea that the brain is the most important thing. It's superior to the rest of the body. So the brain is higher, okay? So we've got the superior and the inferior vena cava. Basically, kind of at the back of the heart, the inferior vena, vena cava comes up with all the dirty blood from your lower body, and it all kind of dumps in together where the vena cavas meet um, the actual top of the heart. So these big vessels are dumping into one space, and most of that blood will go down into the first bag of your heart. Your heart has four bags. It has on the right side that we're talking about right now, the right atrium. Atrium are the top half and ventricles are the bottom half of your heart. So if there's four bags, there's a right atrium and a left atrium. There's a right ventricle and a left ventricle. Make sense so far? So right now we've cut the heart in half this way. So we're talking about the right side. So we know that all the dirty blood is coming back into the heart on the right side and goes to the right atrium. The muscle from the, the right atrium will squish. So all of the, the green color here is supposed to represent um, the actual muscle of the heart. So with that, when it squeezes, it pushes the blood down. It goes through a little valve. We'll come back and talk about valves in a few minutes. When it's squished down into the right ventricle, when that part of the heart squishes, it pushes it up into the pulmonary arteries, okay? So anytime blood is leaving the heart, it's in an artery. <clears throat> so the pulmonary artery, is it, still, is it clean blood or dirty blood? Clean. It is not clean. No, dirty. It is dirty. Let's get back to this. So we're talking about the right side of the heart. As I mentioned, all the dirty blood has dumped into the right side and there's muscle pushing the blood up and through. So it's being pushed out of the heart, therefore it's an artery, but it's still dirty. It hasn't gone to the lungs yet to get clean. Okay, so the right side is always, I'm just gonna put it up here, dirty blood, okay? So again, going back to the idea that veins um, flow blood back to the heart and the misnomer of 
that they're always dirty is not accurate because here's an artery that's full of dirty blood. Okay. When it goes to the lungs, deep in our lungs, um, we have our little alveoli, the little grape things I've talked about before. And the blood vessels actually kind of wrap around each of the little balls of the grapes. Okay. Um, as long as they have the ability to um, get air from that's inside of the grape into the blood, it also has the ability to take any of the dirty stuff and push it back into the alveoli. Okay. Everybody understand what I'm saying there? When you say dirty, you're specifically talking about dissolved gases, not stuff that would go through the human? Usually carbon dioxide is what yeah. we're talking about. It can be other... Nitrogen. Yeah, so it's basically like the waste material yeah. of your cells because they are taking the oxygen as it's floating around. Do you remember the idea of the raft on the river? Yeah. 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 So the raft, oxygen's fallen off of the raft and gone in the cell, and on the raft, it's now carrying... The, the waste, the garbage. The thing that just confused me was dirty. And when I think of cleaning blood, I think of kidneys. Yes, so that's a different yeah. mechanism yeah. of cleaning yeah. it. Yeah. So dirty is, we're just going to put here CO2, okay, carbon dioxide. Yeah. Okay. So it's now in the lungs, it's dumping its carbon dioxide into the alveoli. In the alveoli, hopefully, it's picking up oxygen. And then all of these little tiny blood vessels around each of your grapes is going to come back into one large vessel on each side. And the vessels showing here from the lungs, there's no muscle behind it pushing. So here it is flowing back to the left side of the heart. Okay. This here that's coming from the lungs to the heart is the pulmonary vein full of clean blood fully oxygenated or at least a large amount of oxygen on the little rafts, okay? So again, that gets rid of the idea that people have said veins only carry dirty blood, not true, okay? Veins always flow blood back to the heart and uh, arteries always pump blood from the heart, okay? So now that we're on the left side, so it's clean or full of hopefully oxygen, um, it's gonna go back to the top into the left atrium. That's gonna squish the blood down into the left ventricle. The left ventricle, you'll notice here, the green that I've drawn is significantly larger than even over here. And the reason why is this has the most amount of muscle for pushing because as it's pushing up, it goes through this thing that looks like a chicken comb called the aorta. The aorta sends, um, oxygenated blood up to the brain, the upper limbs, and it actually makes a curl straight down, you'll notice it coming here, and it goes back to the lower part of your body. Okay. So that's the flow of blood through the heart. Now, what, um, like why are there valves? I said we mentioned the valves. The valves exist so that they close between contractions. When you listen to a heart, which we will do tonight, I've got the stethoscope out, um, the top two bags, the top two chambers, the atriums, will squish together at the same time, forcing the blood out of both sides down into the ventricles. This giant muscle in between them is called the septum, and it blocks anything from going, like the, the dirty blood to go into the good blood you know, and cross-contaminate each other. When someone says they have a hole in the heart, or I was born with a hole in the heart, it's usually when, when infants exist in the uterus, there is a hole. And when you're born, usually within 24 hours, that hole closes naturally. Because when you're in uterus, you're using your mom's um, respiratory system to clean the blood going to your little, uter or your little fetus body. When you're out in the world, this hole closes because you're not relying on mom anymore to keep oxygen. Um, instead, it's relying on your own system at that point. Okay. So when somebody has a hole in the heart, it's usually somewhere here in the septum. So it makes this dirty and clean blood. Now, when the two squish down, they open up the valves and they let the blood down. As soon as they squish down and stop, those valves then close nice and tight so that there's no backflow up. Then, right after 
and I'm talking milliseconds after those, those valves close, the muscle around the ventricles then swish and pump it to the lungs or to the body. Okay. Now, along with all of that, with the squishing, there's a couple things when we get into the defibrillation and, and how it works, it's important to understand the electrical system of the heart too. So I've drawn here the SA node. When somebody says uh, pacemaker of the heart, that's your pacemaker cell, okay? That can generate electricity on its very own. There are very few cells in the body that can do that. This is one of the major ones. When this little cell generates electricity, on average, the um, electricity it generates is greater than 60 times a minute, which makes your heart beat at least 60 times a minute. Okay. When the electricity from here gets sent down, the next stop, if you think about this like a long set of stairs that has those little um, annex, sorry? Landing. landing. So like you go down five stairs and then landing, turn, and then go to the next five stairs, landing, turn. That's what your, your electricity is going through your heart. So this is the top of the staircase. The first landing is called the AV node. So how are you ever going to remember this? Really simple. Sino atrial. So what's your top two bags called? Atrium. So what's going to stimulate the atrium to generate is the atrial node. Pretty simple, eh? What are the bottom two called? Ventricles. So this is the atrial ventricular node because it's right between them. Make sense? So as generating the, the electricity down, everybody thinks it shoots exactly what's drawn here. It's not quite how it goes, but for simplicity's sake, we're gonna say that it electrifies both and then lands on the AV node. The AV node can also generate its own heart rate. If the AV node had to generate its heart rate, it's going to be 40 to 60 beats per minute. We'll get to why that's important in a few minutes. From there, this then shoots down again through some of the tissue here to the next landing. And this is just the, the scientist that figured it out. It's called the bundle, because it's a bundle of, N -D -L -E, um, bundle of cells of, and again, scientist's name, His. It's a bundle of His. Okay. From there, it then separates into two branches. The branches are pretty simple. They're called bundle because it's a, from the bundle, branch, and based on what side it's going to, it's either the left or the right. Pretty simple. Okay. So again, AV node most of the time starts your heartbeat or starts the electricity to cause the top two chambers to go squish and push the blood down into the ventricles. Once it's squished it down and it's ready to relax, the um, valves will close and block the blood from backflowing. And then all of a sudden the ventricles go squish. And that is generated because of the electricity between these spaces, okay? So squish and the blood goes to the lungs or the heart, or sorry, lungs or the body, my bad. If somebody says, um, or somebody has damage to the top part of their heart, the bundle of hiss can also generate a heartbeat. However, it can only do it from 20 to 40 beats per minute. So when you've got the situation, the time that you're on duty and somebody's complaining of chest pain and you take their heart rate and it's 20 and you're going, I must be missing something. No, no. 
it's very possible that it is 20. Okay. Um, obviously, the lower it is, the less good it is for you, and your brain's not going to get the oxygen blood it needs because nothing's pumping out efficiently. Right? We need, on average, most adults need at least a heart rate of 60 to maintain a good, healthy state. Make sense? Okay. Now, there's a couple of times um, that this can be affected that we need to be aware of. The first one is anytime somebody has a heart attack. So what exactly is a heart attack? I can't hear what you just Malfunction. The heart malfunctions of some sort. Uh, so it, that's very the heartbeat. Bad. Yeah. Uh, not getting enough blood to it. That's way way more clear than <laughs> than before. So okay. Um, so we have arteries and we have veins. We know what the difference is now. Arteries pump from the heart. Veins uh, flow blood back to the heart. In your entire body, uh, from your fingertips to your brain to whatever, we have arteries and veins everywhere. And regardless of where the vessels are, they can go through some changes. So we're going to say that this one is an artery. That doesn't look right, but whatever. So far, by my amazing drawing skills, what's the difference between them? So arteries are considered much larger than veins are. Yeah, I know. Everybody's like, oof, that's some good drawing. We all know that I can't draw. We've already established that. No, 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 that works really good. <laughs> Thanks. That's when I sit down and take my time when I'm a kid. So as blood's flowing through the artery and the vein, or in the case of the artery, is pumping through it, the artery, if you think about it, if you were to blow something out really fast, it's causing a sudden pressure wave. So because this is a sudden pressure wave as the ventricles smushing and pushing the blood out with every beat, the walls of the artery are actually um, very elastic and they'll get bigger and smaller to accommodate when a large push comes through from the ventricle. Okay? So these, I'm just going to put little arrows up and down because they move. We know that veins, it flows, there's no muscle behind it pushing it. It's just naturally going to um, go back through a vein. These do not change size, so they don't move. Okay, another important part. As we live our lives, we do things that aren't necessarily the best for our arteries and our veins. Um, so what kind of things can affect the artery and the vein walls. Anybody know? Smoking. Yeah, so let's talk about that one. Smoking, you're breathing crap into your lungs, making it so oxygen, oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange doesn't happen as easily, as well as all the tar, nicotine, everything else building up. So as your little raft, the red blood cells, the hemoglobin are carrying through to your blood vessel, or sorry, to your alveoli, it doesn't do that exchange very well and therefore it maintains a carbon dioxide level, picks up tar at the same time, and then as it's going around, it's going to deposit that tar everywhere. And again, these are your arteries and your veins in your brain that feed your heart muscle, that feed your lung tissue, etc. So it doesn't look like much. This guy's only been smoking for a couple of years, but there's crap building up that wasn't there had he not smoked. What other lifestyle choices um, do we make that can affect this? Mm. Food. So the higher the cholesterol in a lot of products, um, cholesterol is a fat and um, there's healthy fats and then there's not so healthy fats. Those build up way quicker. So these fat deposits accumulate and are really, really sticky which is not so good because if they're sticky, more stuff, more other bad decisions we make will stick to them. What else? Genetics. Yeah, your genetics. Obviously we can't control that, but if you naturally have, um, we know that artery walls are elastic, but if you naturally, um, genetically, have thicker walls, 
they don't move as easily. We all know when we get a little thicker in spots, we don't move as easily. So now you're genetically predisposed to thicker walls. You could be predisposed to the inside of the vessel actually accumulating stuff faster, not just these fat deposits that you put in, but everything is sticky. Okay, So that makes the artery not as well. What else? Injuries. Injuries. So one of the big uh, causes of injury in blood vessels is um, the diagnosis of diabetes. So what is diabetes? Well, type 2. So ultimately... There's a balance of basically depends on insulin and sugars so regardless of type 2 type 1 we're not going to talk about like in depth what diabetes is but basically you have um, a higher level of sugar that's floating around in your arteries and veins than you should okay so if you um, did a, a finger prick to do a blood sugar on someone or one of their fancy little wave their phone over it their blood sugar should come up a normal healthy person should be between 4.4 and 6.6 okay so if it's higher than 6.6 .6, which is what your brain kind of needs to again stay awake and functioning there's a lot of sugar molecules floating around what's going to happen when these sugar molecules get to those sticky fat it's going to stay there it's stick to them for sure so now whoop, i'm trying to do this colorful so everybody can see so now we've got sugar sticking to these fat cells. This whole time, what's happening to the size of the artery itself? It's shrinking, it's getting smaller. The other way that sugar affects the arteries themselves is if you think about it, sugar under a microscope is a crystal. It's got sharp pointy edges. And as that crystal is floating around, it can actually scrape the inside of your um, vessel tissue your cells so it would be like taking your hand on a cheese grater what's going to happen to the tissues of your hand rip they're going to get abraded so like little tiny bits are going to dangle um and then after that with healing there will be inflammation and and which is your swelling um scar tissues are going to form and this whole time the diabetic all of these little crystals are causing these little scars to accumulate on the vessel walls too so again, it's getting narrower and narrower. Now, atherosclerosis is a term that's used in first aid. Most people don't understand it. But basically, it's a really fancy way of saying the crack inside your arteries. Okay. When we've done our blood pressure practices, which we didn't do tonight, but when we're doing the blood pressure practices, and when I've explained how and what each number means, um, what would, what number, the top or the bottom, would indicate that there's this stuff building up? Well, the, bottom. the bottom, that's right, because what does the top number, the systolic number, represent? Pressure from the heart. Pressure from the heart at the moment it goes, Poof. okay. So as it's pushing through, it's expected that, you know, not everybody's going to be this damaged, but by the time you get to middle aged, which we just learned was 33 and a half or whatever, that's a little scary. Some of this is going to accumulate. So the top number represents the push through that. The force against the inside of the walls or whatever's in there, um, how much pressure it takes to get the blood through. The bottom number is when the heart is not pumping. So when the ventricles have taken their pause to allow the whole heart's electrical system to reset and get the SA node to snap another electricity uh, piece again. When it's not pumping and the arteries just stagnant, what is the constant pressure in here? And the higher number, the bottom number, indicates that there's a higher pressure or lower space for the blood. Does that make sense? Cool. So when somebody, again, when you're taking your blood pressure, and you've got um, a patient who is uh, having chest pain and you take their blood pressure, it's 160 on 110. Like that's a good indicator that something bad's happening, right? 
If you take their blood pressure, that can tell us um, that their blood's not flowing through easily, it's under a lot of pressure. But by also taking their blood pressure, we should be taking the other vital sign of the pulse to tell us if the SA node and the electrical system is being affected at this time, okay? So they go hand in hand. Um, something important to keep in mind as well is if you can't get a blood pressure, let's say you don't have a blood pressure cuff with you, um, if you can take a pulse in certain spots, it indicates that the top number, your systolic, is at least a certain amount. What I mean by that is if I didn't have a blood pressure cuff and Chad's my patient, if I take his radial pulse, so at the wrist, and there's a pulse there that I can feel, then his systolic must be at least 80, okay? Which doesn't indicate what the diastolic is, the, the dangerous one, but if it's at least 80, we know he's somewhat alive, and his SA node is kind of working as long as it's above 60 beats a minute, okay? If I can't get a radial pulse on Chad, the patient, and I decide to take a femoral pulse, which we've all practiced in the little private space of your patient, that indicates that the top number is at least 70, okay? And if you cannot get a femoral pulse, but you can take a uh, carotid pulse, that indicates that the top number is at least 60. So we've talked about blood pressure, but what, why do I care if it's 80, 70, or 60? So oh, that's wrist, um, femur, and carotid. Along with all of this pathophysiology of heart and electrical system, a systolic, um, again, the, the amount of pressure it's pushing through with each beat, if you do not have a um, pressure of at least 65, it's called a pulse pressure of 65, um, your brain's not getting enough oxygen. You'll have brain damage. So when you check someone's femoral pulse and they don't have one, and you check the carotid and they do, you're probably in that, oh God, they're gonna have brain damage if we don't get this fixed, like now. Understand? Okay, along with all of this. So we've talked about atherosclerosis, how this crap builds up. Ultimately, what happens in the heart attack, the, what I was trying to get everyone to kind of guess at is the blood is being forced through suddenly with each beat. And the blood hits this piece of, I don't remember what the light green was, diabetes, sugar. It hits this piece of sugar build up and it breaks it off. So now we have this free floating piece of sugar. As the blood is gonna continue being pushed down further in the artery, what's going to happen to that piece of sugar? It's gonna go too. It's going too. And then when it gets to that next spot, it's gonna block. block it. Now here is some of the pathophysiologies we need to be aware of. The first one is, Angina. What is angina? It ended, one of the symptoms is pain. But basically, it's exactly what I've just showed you there. So there is a temporary um, blockage or the artery walls themselves, instead of a blockage, have um, gotten smaller and haven't enlarged like it should and it's creating less blood flow. A little bit of blood flow can still get through, but not enough to keep the tissue that it's serving uh, alive and healthy. This artery for angina and for heart conditions we're talking about today, all of the veins and arteries we're gonna talk about are surrounding the heart and they're called the, what type of arteries? Grides up here. believe in you guys. Easy at the heart. Coronary. 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 So the coronary arteries 
are letting a little tiny bit of blood through, but not enough to keep the, the area of the heart that this artery is feeding a lot. Now, some of you might be going like, what do you mean? Because it's got blood inside of it, it can pick up oxygen from in there, but it can't. The inside of these bags are lined with a different type of cell that cannot absorb the stuff from inside. It has to be fed from the outside arteries and the dirty blood uh, goes back in the outside, the coronary veins, okay? So let's say that this artery feeds this big muscle of the heart. Not very much blood is getting through. The person is going to have not a heart attack. There's still blood getting through. Pain. Angina is a temporary pain caused by insufficient amount of blood getting to an area of the heart. Okay? A heart attack is what? A complete lack of blood. So no blood can get by and it's blocking it completely. And regardless of what you do as a first aider, uh, whatever your patient does, um, it's not moving. This is going to kill part of the, the heart. And if this artery is feeding the area of the heart that's large enough, it can kill a large part of the heart. The scariest ones and the, where most of the heart attacks happen are in this very large coronary artery that comes down and feeds all of this muscle. If the left ventricle muscle isn't able to pump and push blood out, what happens to the blood inside of it? Ooh. It pools. Backflow, clot. And if you don't get blood out of the ventricle, where did, let's go back to how blood flows through the heart. From the left ventricle, where did the blood go? The aorta, the aorta into the body, including brain. the brain. So your heart, ultimately, the muscle's not working. There's no blood or very, very little bit of blood leaving the left ventricle. The person will have an altered level of consciousness. They'll be pale because their brain is going, oh God, I don't have enough oxygen. Suck it away from the skin. They're going to be sweaty. They're going to be um, anxious because they can feel the pain in their heart. But a lot of people who are having like a legitimate going to kill you heart attack will have this impending doom feeling like they're about to die. Believe them because they probably will. Okay. So if enough of the muscle damaged um, is damaged from this blockage, it will never be repaired. So. We now talked about a heart attack where it blocks the flow, muscle dies, guy drops dead, Bob's your uncle, we gotta do something. Let's say he's having a heart attack and no blood's getting by and it's only affecting, it's still affecting the, the left ventricle, most common spot, but it's only affecting a smaller area. The rest of the muscle can still squish, it's just not gonna be as effective at getting the blood up and out, okay? So if this guy's had this clot for a few hours or whatever, it's going to cause damage, but it's hopefully not enough to completely shut down the left ventricle. After all of this, and after it's kind of taken care of, they get aspirin to thin out the um, clot and prevent it from sticking further. They get blood thinners. They may go to a cath lab to get a stent. We'll talk about what that is later. Um, after that, regardless, let's say, Here's the bottom of your heart. Let's say it kills this. We know that this part of the muscle won't work. The rest of it will, and it's gonna kind of be sluggish, pushing out and up into the aorta. When it can't clear all of the amount of blood that's in the left ventricle, again, it, some of it sits there, stagnates, and does what? Clots. It will also if there's enough, because the rest of the heart's still pushing blood down, if there's buildup, it's, it kind of swirls and swirls and swirls in here, and eventually no more blood can get in here because only 25% is getting out with each beat instead of 100. So it's going to actually back up into the atrium. If this guy's had damage here on the left ventricle 
and it's causing a backflow of blood into the left atrium. If there's still more backflow, as more and more of the heartbeats happen, and it backs up from the left atrium, where is it going to back up to? Mm -hmm. The lungs. All of this is called congestive heart failure. So someone with congestive heart failure has had a damage of some sort in the past that does not allow a full clearing of the blood and it's backflow. If it's on the left side, the most common spot, it backflows into the lungs and it leaves a lot of the liquid in your blood actually sitting in the alveoli. Somebody with left-sided congestive heart failure with any type of um, not even vigorous, but even like movement. If I have a heart condition and my heart can somewhat beat effectively sitting back and relaxing like this, if all of a sudden I get up to go to the bathroom, my heart has to pump harder and now it's going to backflow more and I'm going to be on shorter breath because it's backflowing into my lungs, knowing that the fluid from my blood is going into my lungs, besides being short of breath and having some chest pain, what is something that we can listen to or auscultate. Sorry? Breathing. Well, yes, you're going to, yeah. but what kind of sound would you hear? Okay. They're called crackles. And basically it's like, you know, when you pour your milk on your Rice Krispies and it goes like snap, crackle, pop, all those. It's just like that. Okay. So if you hear crackles when you're listening and they're having chest pain, they're probably having a congestive heart failure episode. Someone can live with congestive heart failure for years. On average, women, uh, 15 to 20 years after they have the diagnosis of chest pain or congestive heart failure. Men, five. Why? Because men never change their ways. Honest to goodness truth. Um, so with congestive heart failure on the left side, chest pain, shortness of breath. These will, will go away with care. The same care we do for angina. We'll get to the care in a few minutes. Now let's go on the other side. Not as common, but damage has happened from a heart attack or whatever over here on the right side. The right side will still push 25% to the lungs to pick up air, and then it will flow to the left and flow out and out to the aorta. Okay? But that 75%, it's not able to push, again, twirls in here. And what is the twirling going to do? It's going to back up, but it's going to have clots. This is where the clots are scary. Okay. So when it's backing up on the right side, it's going to back up into the right atrium, right? So left vent or sorry, right ventricle into the right atrium. After the atrium's filled and isn't pushing blood out down, uh, where is it going to back up to? Lungs. The lowest spot possible. The lowest spot possible. So the lungs are from the left side. Bye. Bye. Um, the right is to the body. And since gravity is supposed to be our friend, it's not. I always fall down because of gravity. But if I'm sitting and I'm saying to you, oh, I just don't feel right. I have some pain. Take a look at my ankles. Lowest thing to the ground. If you've ever seen anybody who looks somewhat normal and healthy and you look at their legs and they're puffed up like an elephant leg, they probably have right-sided congestive heart failure. Even though it's not congesting in their lungs, it's congesting in the body at the lowest point. Okay. By congesting in the body, it's also not only the lowest point, it will congest other places. If it is so bad what's ultimately going to uh, the patient going to present with besides large feet and large legs they may but that's usually left-sided if i only have right sorry pale. yeah they'll be pale but the swelling itself is going to be so dramatic that if you squish your thumb into their leg and you raise it up you'll actually leave your thumbprint in their their leg so that's how much swelling there is. You can actually squish. It's like having um, like a sponge and you just like squish the sponge. The fluid pushes out to the other cells. Your thumbprint leaves. Even worse than leaving your thumbprint 
is you leave your thumbprint and you look at the leg itself and it's actually weeping. It looks like the leg is excessively sweaty because of all the fluids sitting down in your legs. Weeping edema, okay? So pitting edema is when you can put a pit with your thumb. Weeping edema is where there's liquid coming through your skin. So those of you who have called the ambulance before um, for one of your patients, and let's say Gloria is the patient, I'm walking in as a paramedic, I'm sure most of you have seen the paramedics and we're just like, oh, we're here for chest pain. And we're just like, oh, how are you feeling today? And we just do a quick squeeze of the ankle to see. Right through their parents, if we, know, if we feel squishiness, we know that they probably have right-sided congestive heart failure. Now, here's the worst thing. We already know that congestive heart failure just sucks, right? This sucks a lot. One side of heart failure will likely lead to the other side having heart failure, and that's, that'll kill you, okay? So the guy with left-sided congestive heart failure, where it's backing up and going into the lungs, there's so much fluid in the lungs, they're always short of breath, they're always crackly. From the lungs, it's gonna back up to the right side, and it's gonna back up to the right atrium, and then it's gonna back up to the legs. So some people actually have both sides congestive heart failure, even grosser. Okay. Cause not only are they going to sound like they're drowning, but then there's going to be liquid coming out of their legs. Good times. Okay. So that's congestive heart failure. Um, what the difference is between heart attack and congestive heart failure. You cannot have congestive heart failure without some sort of damage to the muscle of the heart. Make sense? Cool. Now, Let's talk about, we've talked about flow. Let's talk about some other like pathophysiologies um, for heart and then we'll talk about defibrillation and, and how it works, hopefully. What other cardiac or heart issues can people have? Just throw some out. Heart issues. Anybody know? Heart murmur. Mm -hmm. Sure, so what's a heart murmur? Um, it's an irregular heartbeat. Right? It's, it's a hole in the heart. It's not a hole in the heart. No. So. Yeah. Oh, it's when the, the don't close properly. That's right. So you what it is, sound. if I'm just going to draw two, but each of the valves, there's four valves in our body. There's the tricuspid. There's the pulmonic, because it's going to the pulmonary artery. We have the mitral or bicuspid valve and then the aortic valve because it's going to the aorta. People often go, okay, I know where the pulmonic one is. I know where the aortic one is because those ones are pretty obvious, but how the hell do I remember tricuspid and mitral or also called bicuspid? So try before you buy. Make sense? So it goes try, pulmonic, bicuspid or mitral, aortic. Tricuspid versus a bicuspid or mitral, it's just in the name. So bicuspid would have how many leaves? Two. Two. Tricuspid would have? Three. Simple. So I'm going to just draw a bicuspid valve with two little wings. So we're going to say this is my atrium and this is my ventricle. As I'm pushing blood down, it opens up and it lets the blood in. As my atrium is finished squishing blood down, it takes a quick like pause. These two valves then do what? They slam shut on top of each other. And it makes it so the ventricle only has one way to push the blood to the lungs or to the body. Make sense? So with the valve, every single time it goes poop and closes, it makes a click, okay? They're really hard to hear unless you've been trained to listen for them. But ultimately what a murmur is, it can be a few different ones based on which valve it is, but it's usually they're not completely closing in a perfect order. So they go like one slam shut and then the other one's like a microsecond behind and it makes a special little click or a murmur, okay? Cool, that's what a murmur is. What else? What other things cardiac wise have you heard of? There's an 
So that's ECG. We're going to get to that in a minute. So some of the things that I think of are like um, around your heart, we know that there's muscle. So this muscle not only can be damaged, but around every one of our um, organs in our body, we ultimately have this um, bag. We're going to call it like a Ziploc bag. And inside of that bag, there's this liquid, very, very scant amount of liquid. And what it does is it protects the heart every single time it goes in your chest from rubbing up against something else. This bag, this fluid in the bag, can accumulate infection. Okay, so if instead of being nice, clear, um, synovial fluid is what it's called, it turns into like a bacteria pus. It can cause the heart um, to have pain. Again, this is a very basic understanding of what pericarditis is. So remember, let's break down the word. We've talked about different um, forms of words before. So what does the term peri mean in medicine? Around, okay, so all around the heart, because card is heart, so all around the heart, and what's itis? Inflammation. inflammation. So there's inflammation all the way around the heart in the bag that's protecting it, the big Ziploc bag. So, yeah, one of the big things is it, it displays with significant chest pain, and any time the, the position of the patient changes, this pus can change position, so all of a sudden it makes it even worse. So that's something from a fire standpoint, Chad, that if you're on a call and someone is sitting there and you're like, well, let me just lay you back a little bit or whatever because you're pale and I want to make sure that fluid is able to get to your brain, if all of a sudden you lay them back a little bit, that shift of the pus inside of the Ziploc bag is going to make their heart not beat effectively. And they're going to be like, oh, God. <gasps> Very good. Nice. Cool. Also keep that in mind for congestive heart failure. If it's left side and it's backing up into the lungs, you put them flat. It makes the, the fluid go everywhere in the lungs, not just where gravity holds it down to the bottom. Cool. Okay. Another term. Now. Let's get into rhythms and how our defib works and won't work. When someone who's taking an ECG of someone's heart, um, they're ultimately looking, as the name uh, tells you, ECG is electrocardio. Some of them are called like EKG, but it means the exact same thing. I think EKG is more like European and British, weird British people. Um, so electrocardiogram, it's looking for, it's a test of the cardiac electricity, which we already know right here, most of the time it should start in all of our hearts at the SA node, the very top of the right atrium. Um, what the electrocardiogram is going to look at is the electrical waveform that the SA node, electricity down through the AV node, electricity down to the bundle of his, electricity down each of the bundle branches, and ultimately down at the very bottom of the heart where that electrical current dissipates is called the Purkinje fibers. Basically, it's like um, it absorbs all the crap that nobody wants. It's like the filter in your pool. Okay, it's not important not going to kill you. So when you look at an ECG, when the heart is not moving, it always stays on a flat line. And that's why when we talk about um, defibrillation and CPR, or when you've heard on ER on TV where they're like, it's flat line. This line literally is just no electricity. Okay. Your heart is not creating anything. Therefore, if it's not smushing electricity through, it's not making the muscle stimulate to um, pump blood, okay? So the flat line is called the isoelectric 
line. Our goal, and what all of us are achieving at this moment, is variations of that isoelectric line. Sorry? Are you sure? Well, you're alive, so I'm assuming your heart is creating some sort of electricity. When the SA node um, starts the electric, electrical pathway, it creates a bump. Okay? Just that. There it is. This is called a P wave. Okay? After the P wave, we know that the blood is squishing down. And then I told you there is a microsecond pause while those valves slam shut. So, hey, no electricity is going through because it's in a pause, so it goes back to the isoelectric line. When the AV node is shooting down towards the bundle of his and the bundle branches start to have electricity go through them, it creates, um, depending on which angle you're looking at, I'll get to what that means in a minute, it creates a positive or negative deflection. Most of us, all the ECGs that you'll ever have done to you, will be a positive deflection. So it's AV node starts, pushes into the um, bundle of his, and then it's going down the bundle branches, and the bundle branches end. No more electricity, goes back to the isoelectric line. After a full heartbeat, swish, pause, swish, pause. There is nothing happening in the heart. In order to create that electric, electrical impulse at the beginning, each of these cells are um, having a chemical reaction to potassium and sodium. I'm not going to go through that whole thing because you guys will not understand any of it, but that's okay. Basically, there's been a major change in the amount of potassium and calcium, or sorry, potassium and sodium, in some ways calcium as well, but potassium and sodium have changed dramatically. After the isoelectric line has happened, most of the time, as these shift back to allow for another impulse to happen, there's a little fella at the very end. So if that's the P wave right here, I'm gonna just do a little dip so you can see it. That is called the Q wave. The peak is the R wave. The bottom deflection is the S wave. And that bump at the back is the T wave. Okay. Somebody back however long ago, hundreds of years ago or whatever, decided those were the names. So, sorry? Yeah, they decided that was the names. So. And so when, when they talk on TV about ST mm -hmm. elevation and that kind of thing. Yeah. So first I'm going to mention about when I said most of us will experience ECGs in our life that shows a positive and then a negative. Sometimes based on where the little stickies are that the paramedic, the nurse, the doctor, the tech, whatever puts on you, think of them like cameras all of the little sticky. So most of the time there's one on your leg, each leg or on your hip. I usually do hip because it's, they don't move their hip as much so they don't end up causing artifact. So usually uh, lower stomach, hip, and then arms, wrists are the ideal spot if your patient will stay completely still, which they never do. So most of the paramedics put it up on the upper chest. <laughs> so hips, chest, and then we look at all the way around the heart. So it literally wraps you feel on yourself, it's really easy to actually landmark. So feel where your collarbones come together. Go down until you feel a little bot, a uh, little notch. Once you feel the notch, come down one more rib, go out, sticker, sticker. Okay, so V1, V2, we always place V4 next, which is nipple line straight underneath the boob. And then V, so that's V4, so V2, V4, where does V3 go? right between those two, <laughs> easiest one to find. Right under the nipple on the fifth rib is where we put the uh, V4. Then you put V6 at the mid auxiliary line, so the middle of your um, armpit. And then we know that V6 is here, V4 is here. Where does V5 go? Right between them, okay? So when you see the paramedics with your patient sticking stuff around their boob, 
That's why they're, we're looking at with cameras from all of these different angles around the heart because we want to see is there damage here, 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 here. We're looking for all of that, okay? If the paramedic has done this and then all of a sudden they're like, oh, we need to do V4R or 15 lead, you'll see them move stickers around and a sticker will come over here. Some, like I always do a 15 lead that goes on the back. That makes me look at the back of the heart. We don't automatically do that because it's super rare to have a posterior heart attack. Like super rare. I've had one that I've caught in my career. That's it. Okay. So based on how the camera's looking, if the camera's looking up as the electricity is coming down, it's looking up, it'll have a positive deflection. But if I have these ones up here and the electricity is going away from these cameras looking at it, that's going to create a backwards deflection. Okay. Just a fun fact. Most of the ECGs you'll ever see, like I said, are up. Because there's very few that create that downward deflection. So now we've mentioned the Q or the ST elevation. Let's go through again. What does the Q indicate? Anybody remember which part of the V? Yeah, so the Q is where the AV starts. As it goes through the bundle of hiss, there's your R, and your S is your bundle of pitches. Okay? So if there's damage, and a blockage that's preventing all of this from working, <clears throat> it's not gonna be deflecting down because dead tissue doesn't allow electricity to get through it very easily. So instead, the isoelectric <coughs> line, right here, the pink. So there's our isoelectric line. We expect the S to at least hit the isoelectric line and then a T little whoop, but, if a heart attack or damage is caused in that most common coronary artery that I've been talking about this whole time, as the electricity is coming down, the farther down it goes, it's going to all of a sudden stop and it's going to try and get through the muscle in different ways and it never really quite gets there and then the heart relaxes in between each beat. So instead of having a nice boop, 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 ST elevation means that in between the S and the T, there's no hitting the isoelectric line and it's elevated on ECG paper. There's big boxes and then inside of each of them, there's like little boxes. And when we're reading an ECG, we look at how many little boxes there is between this and this. Depending on which sticker I'm looking at, it can be one little box or it can be two little boxes. So if this is higher than one or two little boxes, depending on the camera, that's ST elevation. That means their artery is not letting blood through, okay? There is damage happening to the heart and it will kill them if we don't get it fixed. Cool? There are obviously other things that can happen when it comes to electricity. Um, somebody who has an issue with their SA node shooting down to their AV node can have something called Atrial fibrillation. That's when the bottom of the heart starts to... I don't know, you tell me. Um, what does atria mean? Just top the top right. So the top of the heart is starting to vib vibrate. Quiver. Yeah, so a lot of times Shiver. people like to think of it like shivering or like yes, you hit like a big jello mold and it's like... Blah, blah, blah. Or like Homer Simpson's tummy when he's doing the like, little fluid thing where it's like... Mm. That's not quite what the heart's doing. Um, but basically, it's having a hard time getting down this pathway. And like I said before, from the SA note, it kind of shoots out different ways, but ultimately, it's not able to get down there, okay? 
but it's not able to get down there. The AV node wants to shoot off itself because it can. So the AV node's trying to, or the SA node's trying to do it at above 60. The AV node's also trying to do it at the same time. And then way over here in the, the left atrium area, there's actually another little pathway that can make like a loop, okay? So ultimately, instead of having this, the heart rate is actually way, usually way faster, greater than 100 is uh, afibulic tachycardia that needs to likely be uh, cardioverted, but it also creates an irregular heart rate because here's the SA node, oh, there's the AV node, oh, here's the SA node, here's the AV node, and the AV node, and the SA node. So they're both going boom, 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 boom. So it's making it irregular, quivery, and if it's quivery, is it pushing blood down? No. So somebody can, can present with chest pain, take their pulse, it's irregular and it's fast, they're probably experiencing AFib. Probably not gonna kill them this instant. If they have a history of AFib, they're probably on a blood thinner. We know, as we've talked about a billion times, because it's not pushing blood down, what's gonna happen to the blood in there? Stagnate, become clots. And the biggest risk of, risk of somebody that has AFib is if they don't get on blood thinners, then this clot will eventually and go to the lungs and create a pulmonary embolism, which will block your alveoli and the little blood vessels, okay? So AFib, not a death sentence. It just means your electrical system's a little bit wired and funny. The first treatment's blood thinners. The next treatment, if that doesn't work, is they'll probably put in a new pacemaker and bypass your SAAV node stuff. Cool? If there's damage to the SA node um, and it's not really firing at all, could you sustain life with just the AV node? Sure. You're gonna have a really, oh, really slow heart rate. Um, you'll be okay. It's not the best. It's a brand new computer, <laughs> like Boxing Day. Um, you can sustain life. It's just gonna mean like you can't get a heart rate above 60. So that old guy that's like, oh, I have to take a leak and trying to get up and he maintains a heart rate of 60. His tissues are not gonna get the oxygen of blood needs to be able to perform simple tasks. So they're gonna become more and more like bound chairs, beds, etc. Not a death sentence, but take care of it. You'll be fine, okay? Um, if the AV node is also damaged, so you've had damage uh, or clotting in the arteries that feed this area or your septum, it's gonna block the electrical impulse from coming through. Can you survive uh, off the electrical impulse from the bundle of hiss? Not really, no, because that amount of beats is not gonna create enough pressure to create a blood pressure with a systolic of at least 60 for a long period of time. And we know we need it at least 65 in order to keep your brain functioning. <coughs> Interesting, eh? Now, let's go back to this idea of ST elevation. Again, indicates that there's damage down here. Depending on how bad the heart attack is, it can actually absorb all of the QRS. So if I was to do an ECG on somebody that was really, really sick, never even comes to a point, and it does that. When I see that, that's bad. That's real bad. We call them, I know it sounds like not politically correct, we call them tombstones. They call what? Tombstones. They look like a tombstone. So imagine seeing like a This guy, from this rhythm, will ultimately, because the, the electrical impulse isn't getting through that at all, and now um, that little curvy thing, it's not getting blood through, will create. Some type of bypass, straight 
Yeah, for sure. Anytime there's ST elevation, the paramedics want to take them to a cath lab. So Kingston, Ottawa in this area. And it's so that a cardiac surgeon and the paramedics take them right into the operating room. We don't even sit there in their little emerge and everything. We go right into the operating room with them. We need a surgeon to clear the blockage that's creating the muscle to die. And they do that by placing a little spring called a stent. Okay. If I ever hear you say stint, I will probably make fun of you. People say it to me all the time. I'm like, it's a stent, not a stint. I remember it because I think of the word tent, and that's yeah. basically what it does. So the little spring, here's your artery, it's full of shit. <clears throat> so it's really blocked. The cardiac surgeon, again, I love colors, right? The cardiac surgeon um, will feed a wire back through your femoral artery or through your radial artery back up here, and at this point, they're gonna send dye out, not down into your heart, but off of the aorta, into the vessels that go around your, your heart and give oxygenated blood to it. Anybody now remember the name of those blood vessels? Coronary arteries. Coronary arteries. So specifically, the cardiac surgeon is going to take this little tube and they're gonna find the opening to the very top of all of your coronary arteries. And then at this point, from the little tube, that tube basically always stays in you while this surgery is happening. In this little tube that is the size of like a fine human hair, they'll send out dye. The dye, at the same time they go squish and push dye into the, the coronary arteries, they take a quick x-ray. And what will happen is all of a sudden you start seeing I guess I should do this a couple of ways because I, all of a sudden you see this. And it illuminates the, uh, the coronary arteries. That cardiac surgeon knows where the coronary arteries are supposed to be. And if all of a sudden they know that this one is supposed to come around like that, but this illumination doesn't happen, they know that the coronary artery has a blockage right there. That's what's causing the damage. They can also go into a heart attack while the injection is being Oh, yeah. Yeah. You can have a heart attack at any point during this whole thing. You're probably already having one in reality if you're getting to this point. Now, so they've injected the dye and they go, oh, way down there. So then the little wire goes farther in and they're going to try and actually kind of poke it through that fat deposit stuff that we've got. At that point, they also send down from inside of the hair this balloon that goes onto the wire that they've now kind of forced through. Then they're going to inflate the balloon and it's going to cause the balloon to squish all of this up and it's ultimately going to cause the artery to do this with all of the crap being pushed back. So that's called a balloon angiogram. Once they have this stuff like really like squished down, at that point they pull the balloon out and then down this wire they put the stent, which again looks like a spring. It goes down really thin and as soon as they put it through the wire, it goes and it holds all the crap that they squish back against the walls and then blood can flow back again through the mesh onto the part that didn't have any blood. Some people's heart attacks are so large, like the amount of clot is so big, they actually have to put stent and then they put another stent, but they always have to have them from the inside so that there's no gap in between them. And people can have like multiple stents placed, okay? At one time, you can have multiple heart attacks and they have a uh, stent put in and then you continue your shitty lifestyle, your stent's probably gonna need a new stent. It doesn't always happen to just people with bad lifestyles. My girlfriend is very healthy. Yep, genetics, everything can. And four cents. Yeah. Wow, we're actually ahead of what I thought we'd be. So then bypass is where they... Okay, so bypass, if a stent will not work, if there is too much damage, we, we can only put so many stents inside of each other to go through. 
right? But now your artery is so clogged that the stents are not gonna work. You can qualify instead for a bypass. So people can have a single bypass, double, triple, quadruple bypass, okay? What that means is your coronary arteries the main branch, like the big thick ones, we really don't want those to be blocked because then all the little offspring twigs won't have any blood. If, let's say this guy has a lot of clots and this guy has a lot of clots and this guy's got a lot of clots and this guy's got a lot of clots and stents won't fix them or will only fix one or two, they may cut your, your put you obviously under cut your sternum open, separate your ribs, um, and then what they do is they, <laughs> they take your, your, your vena cavas that dump blood into the right side of the heart, and they sew in this little temporary tube while your heart's beating. So they sew in this little tube, and then in your aorta, they sew in another tube. And what ultimately will happen is while you're having your artery that's clogged up or your arteries that are clogged up removed and replaced with other arteries from somewhere else in your body that aren't important, like they'll take some from like a breast tissue, that, eh, whatever, or like from a foot, they'll take an artery from somewhere else in your body and they'll swap it in. They'll do like a cut, cut, sew it up. And it creates new arteries. Um, so when they have you cut open, and so here's your inferior and your superior vena cava, they're going to dump together and then go into your right atrium, that's what the carol's drawing. So here, we'll just say they're going to put in this tube. Oh my god, I believe it's not like the race. So here's our temporary tube, and then here's our aorta. Like I'm missing something there. Right here, they sew in a temporary tube. What ultimately happens is all the blood's coming back from your body, flowing back. It can't go into your uh, right side of your heart. Instead, it bypasses out, down a tube, out of your body to a bypass machine. You get hooked up to the machine. The uh, machine is a heart lung machine if you've ever seen that on or heard it on er or whatever a heart lung machine is a bypass machine which takes the dirty blood oxygenates it and then pumps it back into the temporary tube in the aorta and out to your brain and your body the whole time your heart is not moving it's at rest it's at rest it's technically during a bypass you are dead you are clinically dead Usually, most surgeons aim for under 60 minutes because the longer you're on a heart lung machine, the more likely you are to clot and die. Okay, so bypass machines require your heart to actually stop. Outside of an OR, we really want to avoid that. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Okay, so now we know where the paramedics are going to get this person fixed. Now it's time to figure out how defibrillation, when we apply an AED, how the hell it works. So our AED pads, again, sorry about my drawing. Oh, oh that's the head. So when we've got somebody who uh, is unconscious and has no pulse, not just unconscious. You do not put defibs, defib pads on anybody with an AED that still has a pulse. Do not do it, okay? Some rhythms that are sustaining a pulse will look like they're not the little um, automatic or semi-automatic machine, okay? So guy is not breathing, has no pulse. Where do we put the pads? I'm not quite sure what you're doing, but so. Right on the upper. So yeah, this is his right side. This is his left. 
So we know that here's the sternum that we do CPR on. That's a very long sternum. We know that the heart sits on the left side a little bit, and it sits on an angle. So there's our core bags, okay? So it sits kind of like cockeyed. When we put our defib pads on, we want to put one on the upper right chest and the second one on the lower left chest. That's the standard placement for defibrillator pads. Okay. There are other placements. We'll talk about that later. When the defibrillator pads are on, plugged in, and the machine is turned on because they're dead, it's going to look for a rhythm. The defibrillator um, can only give you indication to shock two if types of rhythms. Is, if there is a rhythm of some sort, right? It two types. It, it won't do it if they're, oh, um, ASIS, asystole? No, that's the one that they don't do. <laughs> so an AED is looking for either ventricular, which indicates what part of the heart? Oh my goodness, the bottom. Fibrillation. And we've already talked about atrial fibrillation. What is the top of the heart doing with atri atrial fibrillation? Bulldog. It's sorry? Bulldog. It's a bolt, yeah, the old jello roll idea. Like it's wiggly and not good. It's not effectively pumping blood. So now it's the same thing. It's wiggly, not really pumping blood, but it's the bottom part doing it. So no blood can get squished up and out to the brain and body. As I said before, if somebody has significant ST elevation, it can lead to ventricular fibrillation. What that means is there's gonna be all over the place, attempts by your SAO to beat, but it's just not gonna go through because there's damage. And it's gonna create this whole heart is just wiggling, trying to get something to generate a squish. That's ventricular fibrillation. The other rhythm that the um, AED or SAED is looking for is ventricular, again, bottom. Tack. Tachycardia. Tachycardia. So let's break this one down. We know it's the bottom. Cardia means heart. What's tachy mean? Fast. Fast. So it's a super fast heart rate generated in the bottom of the heart. And it's squishing, or it's attempting to squish the bottom of the heart so fast that even if it was able to push anything um, and get stuff up, there's no pause happening. So the left atrium goes to squish, pushes blood down normally, pause, and then swish and pops out. But now it's going squish, but this is going, so it's never relaxed long enough to actually let it fill with blood from that atrial squish, okay? So it's moving super fast, no blood's really getting into it, therefore no blood's really getting in, therefore you have no pulse. So when I said do not put an AED or an SAED on someone with a pulse, ventricular tachycardia, some can be with a pulse and some can be without a pulse. Uh, when tachycardia usually gets about 160 or more, that's when blood doesn't leave the heart, therefore no pulse. So if you put the AED on somebody with ventricular tachycardia, at a rate of 120, they're still getting blood out and you zap their heart, stop it dead. You've killed them. You have done something malicious. So if they're still alive, you go, hey, let me see if I can fix it. Boom, they stay dead. Whoops. Okay, so we never put it on somebody that has a pulse. Okay, so with this one, we know what a normal rhythm is supposed to look like. So this one is just it looks kind of like a normal rhythm, but it's super fast and it's steady. Bump, 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 bump. Okay. There's another type that the paramedics deal with that is slightly irregular and little lumps and bumps can kind of jot into certain places. That is not shockable for most people, okay? 
So the AED that you're putting on your patient is looking for these two rhythms. If what it sees between these two pads is anything but this, it will say no shock indicated. So a couple examples, you already mentioned one, asystole. So that's a fancy word for what? Flat line. Flat line. Okay. Let's go back to a couple minutes ago when I said the isoelectric line indicates there's no electrical activity. That's a flat line. So ultimately, there's no electrical activity. The SA node's not even trying. The AV node's not even trying. Bundle of hiss isn't trying. There's nothing happening in the heart. Same as VEA? No. So something else to think about if you ever were able to do a print off where the paramedics are there and we're like, oh, it's asystole, you may kind of see like a, that's most of the time we still consider that asystole because it's pretty flat. Okay. So what happened to the football player? The football player? Monday night. I have no idea. I don't watch it. Oh, he dropped. He took a hit to the left side, clean hit down. I know exactly what happened. So one second. Asystole flat line. It's not going to shock that because the heart's already stopped. A shock with these two rhythms is meant to zap the SA node. And ultimately, you've seen the Mars bar commercials that are like, dude, you're playing like Betty White. And it's like a football player taking out Betty White. And then he has the Mars bar or whatever, Snickers or whatever the hell it is. And then all of a sudden he's normal. So it's kind of like walking up to the person who's talking gibberish and just slapping them really hard across the face. And they go, whoa. And they're like, oh, breath. Uh, the heart is jiggly because of all the bad rhythms not being able to get through. We zap all of this, stop it. To restart. To allow the heart to restart itself. AEDs and SADs and, and like manual defibrillation does not start the heart. It actually stops the heart from doing shit that doesn't allow blood to leave it. Reboot. Yeah. And as long as the FA node is somewhat healthy, fingers crossed, it should start again. Okay. The less time the person is unconscious and needing CPR, um, the more likely that's going to regenerate a new pulse quickly. Okay. So asystole flat line. You mentioned PEA. PEA looks like this. What else looks like that? Yeah. So PEA is a rhythm um, that is basically exclusive to blood loss trauma. Uh, or a fluid loss trauma. I shouldn't say blood loss. PEA is pulseless, so no pulse, electrical, activity. So it's firing, but not, yeah. not pump. It's, it's firing through, and either the, the actual muscle's mechanism to be able to squish is gone, which is not as common as it's squishing the heart, but there's no blood in the heart to push out, so you have no pulse. So the guy that's at the speedway and takes you know a shrapnel right across his friggin throat and there's blood everywhere okay his heart's working technically you can sh you can hook that up to your defib but it's going to say no shock indicated because it's showing that there's a normal heart rate and heart rhythm there's just no blood the machine can't tell there's no blood it just knows that there's a heart rhythm so i can't shock that so an AED will mention either shockable or shock indicated. So shock, one, two, that's it. These and all other rhythms that your heart may do are no shock indicated, NSI, okay? Um, so a lot of people think like, oh, the dead guy, I'm doing CPR, I'm gonna put in the defib and save him. That's not the case. There's lots of variable factors in that. How long the guy's been down? How much damage is there to the heart? Is the electrical system still intact? Can, if we get the electrical system to pause and reset itself, can the muscles sustain squishing again? Is there blood in the whole system? So there's lots of variable factors that in reality, the only thing we can affect as first, first responders is to get on the chest quickly and do your CPR as effectively as possible. And that includes switching out every two minutes because you will get tired when doing CPR on a human. It's a lot of work, okay? Okay. Um, now, when the paramedics arrive, 
or in, in this case, the firefighters arrive, because that's usually who leads us there, especially if you're out in like North Augusta, because there's no ambulance in North Augusta. Mm -hmm. I just happen to be there, but probably not. So you put your defibrillator pads, upper right, lower left. When the fire department comes, Chad, and he's gonna show up and he's gonna do what? Oh, sorry, you're also fired. Air, air Airway breathing. They may or may not get you to remove your pads so that they can put theirs. Or if it happens to be perfect, the pads that we use, depending on the fire department, may be the same pads they use. So they may say, hey, we're just gonna switch out the defense. Okay? Don't be upset. If you get a analysis and the machine saying shock indicated, charging, stand clear of the patient. When they're charging, if you can do it safely, the charge usually takes three to 10 seconds. And that three to 10 seconds, if you're not doing CPR on the person, that's three to 10 seconds of blood not going to their brain, okay? So if you can safely do it and you trust the person that can push the button, when it's charging, you should be on the chest doing CPR, okay? If the firefighters or the paramedics are walking in as it's going and we're walking through the door, what do you do? Shock. Shock the hell out of them. Because in 30 seconds, when the fire department gets their stuff set up or I get my crap set up, that shock over them could be gone. And you lost your one opportunity that you had to get the heart to possibly reset itself, okay? So keep that in mind. Um, upper right, lower left, do what the machine tells you to and not until either the firefighters say, okay, I gotta switch these pads out because it doesn't work with ours or they may use your machine or the paramedics come in. We're gonna 100% switch them out because you, like nobody uses what we have. Do. You use LP15? Oh, there you go, you're fancy. So the other pad placement, because I said there are multiple pad placements is on children, we learn this in BLS CPR, um, but it actually can be used for adults too, is one of the pads on the sternum and one of the pads mid spine. So it's kind of like the human is the creamy center of an Oreo cookie, okay? It really is, humans are kind of creamy centered, right? So <laughs> this is anterior posterior positioning. Uh, it's always taught in public first aid courses, BLS, for children because the idea is that on an adult, the bone density of your sternum can cause some of the electrical impulse to dial down a little bit, which may make it so the SA doesn't get the amount of shock it needs. That's not really true, but that's what we teach. <laughs> um, but that's not really true. As a paramedic, if there's a reason why I'm not going to go upper, right, lower, left, like somebody's extremely large and it's very far away, very far away from the heart, then I may not use somebody who's this wide, those pad placements. It's not gonna generate that electrical impulse with enough intensity to hit the SA node. I may choose to, to Oreo cookie them. If, um, if you guys are doing upper, right, lower, left, or lower, left, and fire guys come in and they're trying it, and then the paramedics arrive, we may, depending on which level of paramedic or whatever, we may choose to Oreo cookie them. Because obviously the, that placement doesn't work for this person. Let's see if this placement will work. And then here's the best part. If it's really not working for anything, but it's in one of those two bad rhythms, sometimes we will do what's called dual se sequential defibrillation. So we leave a set of pads up here, we put a second set and a second defibrillator right here. And then the advanced care paramedic turns it to manual mode. And then we go your SAD or your SAED. We're gonna count down one, two, three, and we're both gonna press them. And then it goes whack, whack, all at once to really hit the SA node. Cause you know what? It's just kind of like the Hail Mary, like let's just give this a go. They're already dead. They're not gonna, they're already having a bad day. They're not getting any worse, right? They did. Now, finally, 
when you call for 911, let's say it's chest pain. I mentioned that um, there's ways to help, I don't wanna say treat the patient, but help their symptoms when they're having chest pain. If you think it's cardiac in nature, for example, angina, congestive heart failure, they may have a prescription for a medication. What medication would that be? Nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin. So nitroglycerin is considered symptom relief, not treatment, okay? It's to help get rid of the symptoms associated with what's going on so that you're not as anxious and upset and there's less pain and then your really, really tight artery can go and open up and then let that little floaty piece of sugar that we broke off float off to somewhere deep in your finger or wherever that's not important, okay? Um, so <laughs> I know that's really dumb, but so we need to treat the people and since really you as first responders cannot tell if someone's having an angina attack versus a heart attack, we're going to treat all of the chest pain the same way. So one of the medications that we want to encourage them to take besides their prescription nitroglycerin is what? Aspirin. Aspirin. It must be aspirin. Not Advil, not Tylenol, acetaminophen. It must be aspirin. Aspirin has been around for like ever for, I want to say a hundred years, probably more. Aspirin has one of the side effects of aspirin is that it makes blood uh, contents not sticky. So that clot that's happened, the sugar that floated off and stuck down to that big jumble of fat and is now clogged, it's going to go in and it's going to cause the platelets, everything that scabs up to not be sticky. So it won't stick and they'll bounce off and the clot gets no bigger, if not, it can get a little bit smaller, okay? It's not the life-saving like, oh, take an aspirin, you don't have to go see the cardiologist. It's not like that, but it helps um, prevent the clot from getting bigger. So the whole TV commercials were like, Bayer aspirin can decrease your chances of dying in a heart attack by 20%. It's 100% true because it makes it so the clot can't get any bigger. Okay, so encourage them to take aspirin if they can. What would be a reason why they should not, and you should not encourage it? So blood thinners and the other big one? No, that's nitro. An allergy. So if they say, I'm allergic to aspirin, mm, what happens when you have aspirin? Oh, I break out in hives. Okay, you're not having aspirin right now. But if someone says, oh, I'm allergic to aspirin, what happens? Oh, my tummy gets upset. That's not an allergy not an allergy yeah would you rather have an upset tummy and be alive or would you rather be dead and not have an upset tummy like there's wouldn't you also rather have hives and not be dead the no, problem is is that when we get to we yeah when we get to anaphylaxis yeah. it just takes that one random extra time you've been exposed to it to <laughs> explode so a real allergy we try to avoid it going to anaphylaxis but yes i get what you're saying yeah so that's nitro only. So aspirin, the only reason why people cannot have aspirin is an allergy or if they're on actual blood thinners. Coumadin, yeah, Coumadin, Warfarin. The people with AFib cannot have aspirin. If they're on a blood thinner, they already know that they cannot have aspirin. They probably have been coached by every single medical professional and pharmacist they've ever seen, okay? Next, if they have a prescription for nitro, as a first responder, what's one of the most important things you need to do before considering even giving them nitro? Make sure it's theirs and make sure you have PPE. Yeah. Blood pressure. Blood pressure and the five rights. Yeah. So let's go through what the five rights are. The right person. So it's their medication. I'm having chest pain. I'm not going to take Vera's nitro because I've never had it. Vera's got some. Let's give it a go. That's a bad idea. Okay. It must be the right person. Right time. It, might be, it must be the right time to take it. So they're having chest pain right now, okay? Dose. Right dose or amount uh, with any type of nitro that you will be giving as a first responder with St. John Ambulance, you will be administering one spray 
under the tongue every five minutes or more. So you're not gonna give it at four minutes and 45 seconds. You're gonna give it at five minutes and 15 seconds. It must be at least five full minutes between. Um, it causes very quick changes. Um, and if you don't wait the five minutes, you can accidentally overdose them, which will drop their blood pressure, knock them unconscious, stop their heart, and they'll die. Bad. It's a lot of paperwork at that point. So it has to be at least five minutes, one full spray. So when you have a nitroglycerin bottle handed to you, just always assume that the little tube going down into the liquid is empty. So take the nitro spray, spray it off to the side, make sure it's got a good, like a Lysol spray, a good spray going, and then go, okay, bud, open up under the tongue. Underneath your tongue um, absorbs, it's called sublingual. SL is the abbreviation when we do paperwork. Um, it's a very quick absorption rate. So this aerosolized medication, we'll call it aerosolized, um, goes into your blood vessels near your, underneath your tongue, right into the bloodstream, bam, right to your heart, okay? It's gonna cause, hopefully, the relaxation. Um, so we can do aspirin once. So how much aspirin are you gonna give them? 280 or 81 milligrams. If they don't have 80 or 81 milligrams or you do not have it, I don't know, do we carry it in the truck? Okay, yeah. so when you go to get it out, it's expired, then if there's a regular strength aspirin, they can have that. So we've talked about the amount now. So uh, the right time, the right medication is nitro, the right person and the right amount. We've done the right way. The right route, yeah. Right. So nitro is sublingual, um, aspirin is what? Chewed. chewed and swallowed yeah we want to break up the, the the compressed pill of aspirin it tastes terrible but again mm, that's too bad you're alive be happy so they want to chew it up so it absorbs quicker and nitroglycerin goes under the tongue tongue sublingual so po and sl okay um if you've given um aspirin you've given a spray of nitro what else do you need to do you mentioned it? Blood pressure. Blood pressure. We know that the artery with nitro will go when it gets bigger, what happens to the pressure inside? It goes down. The, the tube gets bigger. So the pressure goes down. Ultimately, your blood pressure everywhere is going to go down, including up to your brain. So um, not just for your patient, but Gloria mentioned about PPE. I wear, not only because it's COVID, I wear not only just like normal PPE, but I make sure when I'm using nitroglycerin in the back of an ambulance, I put the exhaust fan on so it sucks the air from inside of the ambulance out quickly. I'll sometimes open a window. If I'm driving, not that I drive as an advanced care, I have to actually like be in the back with them. But if I'm driving, I used to open up the window and stick my head out because nitroglycerin not only affects the person, but when you spray it, its aim is under the tongue, but it can go anywhere. So it will drop your blood pressure as well. Yes, Bonnie, you have a question. Yeah, did we get all five rates? Because I think I missed Yes, one. so I use the acronym TRAMP. The right time, the right route, uh, the right amount, the right medication, and the right patient. So these are the five rights. But there's actually seven. So the extra two is documentation, and, right to refuse. documentation yeah. and the right to refuse. So it's tramp doctor or reverse it, Dr. Tramp. Okay. So whenever you're going to assist with medication or administer medication, it has to be documented. It has to, on that little line on the, on the patient care form, which we're gonna talk about in two weeks on the 23rd because it's, uh, what was that day? It was like handwriting day or something. So we're gonna do PCRs, PCRs. on that day. Um, when you're writing it out, it should be nitroglycerin, 0 0.4 milligrams, which is one spray, SL sublingual, and then make sure the time is in there 
and then at the other side it'll say like results so decreased blood pressure no change to pain or decreased pain no change to blood pressure woohoo look at us winning time asa 81 times 2 81 milligrams times 2 po chewed and then result unremarkable because you're not going to know if it made a damn difference unless they stay alive then probably it did cool so cardiac pathophysiologies things like pericarditis and congestive heart failure again not going to kill you angina it's a temporary uh, decrease in blood flow to areas of the heart temporary not going to kill you but if it's not taken care of and you don't go to um, a physician and get care for it it's only going to get worse right as i said you get diagnosed with congestive heart failure men you've got five years because they don't tend to change we all know that. i'm looking at the women right now we all know that okay women we tend to go oh god overboard and go like let's change every aspect of our life so that we get 20 years <laughs> cool um yeah any thing that you need clarification on before we call it a night um sorry i didn't catch what dr was oh sorry documentation and the right to refuse so they may say you know what i don't like the way that nitro makes me feel so i just i don't want to take it yes i have a prescription for it but i don't want it right now or um i know that you say that you're allergic to aspirin but you told me that all it does is cause an upset tummy and makes you have a little bit of heartburn i can't force you to take it i'm highly recommending that you do um and they say, no, I don't want to take it. It causes too much of an upset. Okay, they have the right to refuse. You cannot force things on people, right? Those of you who had the MFR okay, course. Should we call the court coroner now? Yeah, don't, uh, don't assault the patients. <laughs> That's bad. Um, yeah, and well, just wait till the paramedics okay get there. Is a different thing. Okay. Uh, the final okay. thing I want to have you guys understand is, again, advanced care paramedics shows up. We can shock life people if we choose to and we do if their heart rate is so fast that they're about to die we're going to prevent it by putting in an iv give some medications the same stuff that emerge does try and slow it down that doesn't work we're probably going to try cardioversion okay yes pulmonary embolisms do they only occur when a clot has gone into the heart or when the left ventricle backs up into the lungs as well and causes fluid to fill up it can happen it's not as common Pulmonary embolisms, most of the time, are generated from the right side of the heart, okay. pumping forward. Yep. Yeah, but I'm not going to say it never happens from the left. It's just extremely rare. Okay. Yeah, and a pulmonary embolism, people can survive because if it's only a little bit of the alveoli that gets the clot and it kind of shuts down one little area of the lung, eh, that sucks. But you live because the rest of the the alveoli are available. If it's a giant one, a giant clot that blocks the um the artery before it gets to the entire left lung you're foobard <laughs> like that's too bad people die from pulmonary embolisms as well presentation is shortness of breath yeah. it's like stabbing chest pain in one spot uh cardiac in nature tends to be like vague so they'll do like oh i'm having chest pain here with the heart attack they just can't pinpoint it with a pulmonary embolism or with um pericarditis it tends to be very like oh god it's right here and they're pointing with one finger so cool okay so there we go happy static electricity day we now know how the electrical system of the heart works